Until the time of separation came, none knew how strong were the attachments formed in our months and years of associations and hardships and dangers as soldiers. His relations to the officers and men of the 2nd Minnesota have always been a matter of pride and satisfaction to the Corps commander, and from no regiment in the Corps will he part with a deeper regret. A.C. McClurg, July 9th, 1865. The Second Minnesota, the boys of Dodge County, the boys of Wasioja. They went from being fresh-faced students and farm boys to hardened soldiers in a matter of months. During their four-year hitch in the Western theater of the Civil War, they came to be rated among the better units in that arena. Their reputation rests largely on their steadiness in three battles at Mill Springs, Kentucky, Chickamauga, Georgia, and Missionary Ridge near Chattanooga, Tennessee. They even earned the nickname Foot Cavalry for having marched over 5,000 miles during the entire war. This is the story of their journey. In 1853, a treaty was signed with the Dakota Indians in which they gave up millions of acres of their land and moved to a reservation along the southern Minnesota River. In 1854, white people from the east began flooding into the area. Towns like Manorville and Rochester sprung up. Within a couple of years, more towns, including Wasioja, Concord, and Owatonna, all the way over in Steele County, grew rapidly. Connecting the towns beyond the rivers was a stage line. Wasioja became an important stop in the stage line, which ran from Olmstead County or Rochester over to Steele County and points further west, such as Mankato. Wasioja was founded in 1856, basically by Curtis Moses and a couple of other uh, gentlemen who built a couple of very uh, simple log cabins there, platted out some land, Curtis Moses had been uh, kind of a PR guy in New York before he came with the Manter brothers and helped to develop Manterville a couple of years earlier. Once the town began to grow, it grew at a tremendous rate. Within a year, year and a half, there were a couple of hotels. There were several log structures. They started quarrying stone out of the, the local quarry and using stone as a building material to build a lot of the, the, the structures in Manterville as well as Wasioja. In 1858, a group of free will Baptists from New England decided they wanted to build a seminary, which would educate children from kindergarten through graduate school. Northwestern College, begun by the free will Baptists, really had as its mission to develop a well-rounded education for young people. They included math, they included science, a lot of music, English, and a lot of religious studies, as most colleges did at the time. As the school prepared to open, they were looking for good educators. One pastor's son was a young man by the name of Clinton Seeley. He agreed to be sponsored by the Free Will Baptists and went down to Wasioja to become their head instructor. The school opened in November of 1860, admitting the first of what came to be nearly 200 students. James George was one of the early settlers in Wasioja, coming right at, almost at the start of the development there. He was interested in land development, but he was also a lawyer and wanted some business. So he became a lawyer dealing in land and built a small law office. He also became one of the trustees of Northwestern College, so he had a vested interest in the school and certainly was known by and respected by a lot of the, the men and women that were students there. 
the school became the very center of the social activity of Wasioja and Manorville at the time. Within a day of the attack on Fort Sumter in the middle of April 1861, news of the war reached Wazioja. James George, a former army officer, got together with Peter Manter and really formulated the idea of recruiting a company from Dodge County. The response of individual men uh, can be told from their own diaries, their own reports, their own uh, memories and discussions. But it ranges, it's largely a question of the right thing to do, patriotism, and the mantra of union. It seems incredible as we now look back upon it that so many could and would divest themselves of all impending business, social, and family obligations and restraints and commit themselves for three years to the then unknown hardships and perils of a soldier's life and time of active service. Judson Bishop. Seeley went in to basically the director of Northwestern College and explained that it would be in the college's best interest to allow the elder students to go, to, to fight, because the need to preserve the union would guarantee the continuation of the school. If the union broke apart, chaos would ensue and the school would probably cease to be. Well, James George was immediately upon news from Fort Sumter, actually before that, when the threat of secession came about. James George, as a former Army officer, was raising a group of militia, um, a company, trying to get as close to 100 men as he could, including a lot of the students and faculty at the school. And so there was a series of meetings in Manorville and Wasioja. Many of the older students, and even their fathers, were eager to enlist in the Union Army and recruitment went along at a good pace. James George had a law office, a small one-room building that was about a half a city block by today's measurement from the seminary right down the street. James would sign up recruits in his office, ultimately turning it into an actual recruiting station, and it became officially recognized as such by the Union Army. It became the, the recruiting focal point for Dodge County. Very few men living in Minnesota at that time had any kind of military experience. So those that did were a hot commodity. Judson Bishop was a mover and shaker in Fillmore County, just to the southeast of Dodge County. Bishop had raised a company of guards, similar to today's National Guard, that had hoped to be part of the first Minnesota. Missing out on that opportunity due to the distance to the state capital, there were promises that he would get command of Company A of the Second Minnesota when it was formed. Horatio Philip Van Cleve was a West Point graduate and a career army man, but was a businessman when the war broke out. He knew that the current governor of Minnesota, Alexander Ramsey, would be looking for colonels for his regiments. Since Willis Gorman was appointed as the Colonel of the 1st Minnesota, Van Cleve put himself in a favorable position to be named as Colonel of the 2nd Minnesota. Second in command as Lieutenant Colonel was Wasioja's own Captain James George, who had been an officer in the Mexican War. The first boys to go, those that signed up in April and May and early June of 1861, went for the thrill of it, went for the the drums and the music and the, the stirring patriotic speeches. Those who grew up or got a little older in the ensuing months and even years before the end of the war that then decided to join up didn't have that pipe dream idea of, oh, soldiering is going to be fun and it will be over by the time harvest comes, so I'll be back in three months. Early on, President Lincoln called for three-year commitments instead of 90 days. Now the price was very real. These young men knew what patriotism was. They had it inside them to set aside their life for the good of their country and their town and really felt that they were defending their own families in this war. 
The physical musterings of new troops from Minnesota took place at Fort Snelling in St. Paul. Well, Fort Snelling is easily one of the most significant sites in the American frontier. When it's essentially founded in 1820, 21, going to being renamed, I believe, in 1823 for Josiah Snelling. By 1861, when it's recommandeered, it's essentially been mothballed. So the boys and men from Dodge County had to get there. Some chose to take wagons, and some chose to walk. One large group, most of the boys and men of Wasioja, left Manorville on June 24, 1861, in wagons. Once the boys arrived at Fort Snelling, which was on the 26th of June, they were actually sworn in by Captain Nelson, who was, that was his job. He was a captain in the regular United States Army. There were regular U.S. troops in Minnesota at that time, particularly up at a place called Fort Abercrombie. And it happened that within four or five days of the boys being sworn in as Company C of the 2nd Minnesota, they were sent up to Fort Abercrombie. So having had no military training at all, they now set out on a trek of about 250 miles on foot across all of Minnesota at a diagonal. And it is now almost the 1st of July. And we know what it's like in central Minnesota in July. It was hot. One of the boys from Ashland Township actually got sick and died the day after they arrived at Fort Abercrombie. He was the first of the second Minnesota to die, but he would not be the last. When young Wheeler died up at Fort Abercrombie, it shook up Company C pretty badly. The heat was horrific up there, and the mosquitoes were terrible. Regardless, the orders came, and it was time for them to head east. So they marched all the way back to Fort Snelling and loaded up for the journey. When they left St. Paul in October, they believed their destination was Washington. When they left Fort Snelling, they went down the river to La Crosse, got on the trains, took the trains to Chicago, followed the same route that their brethren, the first Minnesota, had taken a few months earlier. But when they got to Cincinnati, they were directed then south to Louisville, Kentucky. It's now December, and the weather's turning cold and wet. Not as cold as they were used to up in Minnesota, but a lot wetter and sickness went through the camps because of a lack of sanitation. And a number of the boys of Wasioja and the guys from this, the full second Minnesota, really, they really took a beating that winter and spring in Kentucky. This was perhaps one of their lowest points so far. The second Minnesota had lost some of their boys from the start up at Fort Abercrombie. Now, the conditions in Kentucky were terrible and they were losing more and they still hadn't even seen any action of battle. They were traveling around, but didn't get to go fight with first Minnesota boys out east. The weather was very wet. There were no Confederates around, and they weren't fighting. They spent a lot of time marching and then sitting in camp. Then, in the middle of January 1862, a Confederate general named Felix Zolikoffer is in their area and ready to do battle at Mill Springs. When the Battle of Mill Springs began, it began with the boys waking up to what's called a long roll. And it's a drum beat that, that is a sign for assembly, that we need to get together in a hurry, form up, because there's a battle coming. And they had to charge into the Confederate mob, if you will, the Confederate attack. And they broke the Confederate line. And right at the head of the, the whole Minnesota charge, as they relieved a couple of other regiments that had been fighting for about an hour and were running out of ammunition, literally, it was a stand-up fight, the Minnesota boys go in at the run and they break the Confederate lines and right at the front is Horatio Van Cleve. With the 2nd Minnesota on one side of rail fence, fighting a Tennessee unit on the other side of a fence, they were literally inches apart from each other. For the boys of Dodge County, engaging in their first real battle one can only imagine what that was like. Just at daybreak, arms were taken and preparations were being made to relieve the pickets when a musket shot, another, then five or six more in quick succession rang out with startling distinctness over on the Mill Springs Road, a mile or more to our left and front. This was the first rebel shot we had ever heard, at last the enemy. Judson Bishop. 
from a soldier's point of view, there was nothing worse than going hand to hand. And it was bad. But at the same time, they won and they drove the Confederates from the field. And they were under the command of George Thomas, a man who would direct them a good part of the next three years. And Thomas grew to love Minnesota soldiers. The Battle of Mill Springs was really the first major Union victory. As a result of the Battle of Mill Springs, the women of, again, Louisville, Kentucky, what would become their almost adopted home, presented the, the men of the second Minnesota with a, a beautiful silk national colors, which the regiment actually forwarded back to St. Paul and is today at the state capitol. The second Minnesota in total is marching under Thomas and they get orders to move down into Tennessee. And there's a kind of a concentration of forces. Grant is moving into Tennessee. Uh, that would be U.S. Grant with uh, his Union Army. Rosecrans is going to meet up with Grant. And George Thomas's brigades are also coming down. And there's going to be a push against a major Confederate concentration at Corinth, Mississippi, just across the border from Tennessee. Well, before the Second Minnesota can get there. There is a battle. It's a two-day battle known as the Battle of Shiloh. Where in July of 1861, there were 3,500 casualties, give or take, at Bull Run, and people were amazed that a battle that large did not determine the outcome of the war, that the war continued on. By the spring of 1862, only nine months later, this battle in two days consumed 35,000 casualties. In fact, Shiloh, as a battle, cost more men than every battle in every war in American history up to that point. It was carnage. Grant eventually had the better end of, of the fight on the second day, and Albert Sidney Johnston, one of the best Confederate commanders, is dead on the field. Beauregard's in charge. He retreats back to Corinth. So the Union maintained the field. The day after the battle, here comes the second Minnesota across the river and they get burial detail. They get to clean up the worst battle in American history. About noon, we arrived at Pittsburgh Landing, and what a horrible sight met our gaze. Dead men were lying in the mud, mixed up with sacks of grain and government stores, some lying in the water, and others trampled entirely out of sight by the deep mud. This was where the great stampede occurred. No pen can picture the horrors of this part of the field. Men can, in the enthusiasm and excitement of battle, see and take part in the murderous work without realizing how horrible it is, but to go over the field the day afterwards in cool blood to gather up the mangled and suffering victims gives one a lifelong impression of the cruelty of war and its pitiful waste of human life. Judson Bishop. Union casualties were over 13,000, with Grant's army bearing the brunt of the fighting Confederate casualties were over 10,000 and included the Confederate's Army commander, Albert Sidney Johnston. Both sides were shocked at the carnage. I had frequently seen pictures of battlefields and I had often read about them, but the most terrible scenes of carnage my boyish imagination had ever figured feel far short of the dreadful reality I beheld after the great Battle of Shiloh. Psychologically, the gruesome task of cleaning up the Shiloh battlefield surely took its toll. They were worn out at this point, and a lot of them became ill, and some even died. Many more were discharged for disability because of inadequate health. We marched 22 miles. I had no shoes. I tore up my shirt to wrap around my bleeding feet, which were so sore that I could not march without great pain. Billy Bircher. When you wonder why it is that they would take sick, not only the physical exertion that they're doing, marching so much and, and fighting and everything, was the food and the water. The food they ate, they ate hardtack, which was a very simple bread. They ate freeze-dried vegetables when the army commissary could get them to them. They would have salted pork, or what the soldiers called salt horse, salted beef. They would eat whatever they could pick along the way. Well, a lot of times, especially in the spring, that would be green cherries, green peaches, unripened corn, they would eat it. They would devour it like grasshoppers, and they would get sick as a result. A large male arrived at 4 p.m. If there was one thing that the soldier delighted in, 
It was to watch the regimental postmaster distribute the mail to the first sergeants of the different companies and to eagerly scan each package to see if there was some communication for him from some dear one at home. If, unfortunately, there was none for him, it was sad to see the look of envy he gave to those who were more fortunate and had received papers and letters from home. But after the owner of a paper had got through with it, the entire company would read it. Billy Bircher. Right around the time of the Battle of Shiloh, Clinton Seeley wrote a letter back to Minnesota to Helen George, who was James George's daughter. In this letter, Clinton really gives a roster of the boys of Wasioja and calls them that. He says, this is what's going on with the boys from Wasioja. It's a, it's a moving letter, it's personal news, and I'm sure that Helen went from house to house back in Wasioja and Mantraville, connecting with all of the families and giving them the report from their son's former instructor. The boys had left Dodge County together in June of 1861, and their experiences since then had brought them even closer. At this point, the men on an individual basis are perhaps a bit discouraged, but collectively they're holding their own. What's keeping them together was their closeness, both at the seminary and also all being from the same couple of towns, the same area, the same county. They can rely on each other's strengths. When one is sick, there's several there to take care of him. January 1st, 1863, New Year. Cold and disagreeable, about as quiet a New Year's Day as I'd ever seen. Our New Year's dinner was not so grand as it might have been, but then it could have been a great deal worse. We had plenty of pork, beans, and hardtack, and the sutler had a large stock of delicacies. He who was fortunate enough to possess any money could, of course, enlarge his bill of fare and live more sumptuously, Billy Bircher. The hardships of death, disease, and endurance would take their toll on any man, and yet these boys would still be boys. Soldiers always have been, and I suppose always will be, merry-hearted fellows and full of good spirits. One would naturally suppose that, having so much to do with hardship and danger every day, they would be sober and serious above the generality of men. Few companies could be found without some native-born wag or wit. Billy Bircher. For the soldiers of the Civil War, their strength and courage was immeasurable. The battles were fought in a manner that required the men to come face to face with the enemy and set aside the fears of one's own death. But the daily life of the soldiers outside of the battles was surely a test of strength as well. Marched 18 miles. It rained all day. This was a terrible day's march. The roads were so muddy and our clothes were so wet that it was almost impossible to march. And I was so tired at night that I could barely write and had partly made up my mind to give up keeping a diary. When a lot of the boys were getting sick, so was their colonel. James George suffered from different things, whether it was a form of rheumatism, so his bones ached a lot, not good weather for that down in the wet south. In any event, George took a lot of sick leave. He was absent from command a lot. Lieutenant Colonel Judson Bishop certainly filled his shoes quite well, and the men came to appreciate attributes of both of their colonels as they referred to them. James George was a very friendly, would sit around the fire telling stories of his time in Mexico with common soldiers, would join them at a campfire. Judson Bishop did not do that, but Judson Bishop made sure that the men were drilled and trained and were on the cutting edge of the army so that they became a fighting unit under Judson Bishop and a very effective unit at that. That ultimately paid a bigger dividend in the, in the security and the safety of, of the regiment. Colonel Bishop had inspection of the regiment. Everything but our clothes was inspected. It was getting to be a serious matter with us. We had not changed clothing for a month or more, and the men were getting filthy and were covered with vermin. We thought that we were accomplishing quite a feat to sustain ourselves with the small quantity of rations that were issued to us without feeding the myriads of graybacks. But we had to remain in this condition until we had clothing issued to us. And when that would occur, God only knew. Billy Bircher. Throughout 1863, things were heating up out east. There were a lot of battles going on between General Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia for the Confederates, while President Lincoln was trying to find the right Union general to command the Army of the Potomac. Out west, 
There were groups like the 2nd Minnesota, which spent a lot of time moving troops. There was a lot of campaigning going on, but very little fighting. The men wanted a fight. The men started writing home about, I did not join this army to march. I joined this army to fight Confederates, yet we're not fighting. Then they hear of the double victories in July of 63 of Gettysburg up north in Pennsylvania and Vicksburg out west under Grant on the Mississippi River. And again, the questions start coming up. How come we're not fighting? What's going on here? They're becoming hardened soldiers, but they've still only been in one real fight at this point. And then comes Chickamauga. Before the Battle of Chickamauga, the Western armies, very much like the Eastern armies, would fight during the day perhaps, and then in the evening, they would gather in between their lines and they would trade Southern tobacco for Northern coffee or Southern newspapers for Northern newspapers, or they would mail letters for each other because there were Southern soldiers with relatives up North and vice versa. Then the Battle of Chickamauga came and it became almost like a death struggle, almost more of a personal fight between North and South very little of the friendliness at night anymore. It became a battle to end, a fight to end the war. September 19th, hot and dusty. At daybreak, as we marched along, we saw troops falling into line on the right of the road. The artillery was unlimbered, and the gunners stood to their guns, and everything had the appearance of a battle. We marched along the rear of the line until we reached the left wing of the army, where we piled up our knapsacks, formed in line, marched to the front and deployed skirmishers. We advanced but a short distance into the woods, which was a pine forest, before we came upon the rebel skirmish line. We heard on our right the heavy roll of musketry and the terrible thunder of the artillery. It came nearer and nearer until, in less time than it takes to describe it, we were engaged with Bragg's army. Billy Bircher. So at Chickamauga, although it took two days to really determine the battle, a lot of that was because of darkness the end of the first day. The fighting itself took one day, and Minnesota moved to three different parts of the field. They ended up late in the afternoon on a place called Horseshoe Ridge. The Confederates had broken through the Union line because of a mix-up of orders. The Union Army, two-thirds of it, is scurrying back to Chattanooga up the road, including the commander, General Rosecrans, who leaves George Thomas in charge of a third of the army. Thomas's corps and and the reserve under a General Granger are to hold back the Confederates to keep them from annihilating Rosecrans's army as it retreats back up the road to Chattanooga. Very dangerous position for the North because if Rosecrans loses his army and Chattanooga, all of Tennessee is lost and there's a potential for the Confederates to follow up with an invasion into Ohio. At Horseshoe Ridge, Thomas throws together a line consisting of the second Minnesota along with other units. The Confederates attack this line several times. George Thomas earns the nickname the Rock of Chickamauga because of the stand they take. As the sun goes down, the second Minnesota is literally standing on Horseshoe Ridge. Some of the men have run out of ammunition, so out of necessity, they pick up rocks to throw at the Confederates because they know they cannot withdraw. They know that they have to stand fast but the sun goes down, and the Confederates do not make that last attack. Our corps fought bravely and retired in good order after having for two days held every position taken, even after the disaster on our right on the 20th. While we held the battlefield, we repulsed every assault of the enemy and withdrew only when our ammunition and supplies had given out. Our band was detailed to the hospital to assist the nurses in taking care of the wounded. We found the different wards filled and the wounded still coming in. We succeeded in keeping the men of our regiment all together on one floor. They occupied five large rooms, and it was heartrending to see the poor fellows as they were brought in, shot and mangled in every possible way. Every few moments we had to take one out who had died and put him in the dead house, where he would remain until there was a wagon load. Then they were wrapped up in their blankets and eight to ten buried in one hole. After the rush was over, each had a separate grave. Billy Bircher. Following Battle of Chickamauga, the 2nd Minnesota remained in Tennessee with the Union Army in Chattanooga. Colonel James George left the regiment, leaving Lieutenant Colonel Judson Bishop capably in charge. Colonel George left us to go back to Minnesota, never to return to us. The men as a unit were sorry to see him go, 
but we had Lieutenant Colonel Bishop in command, and we knew that when he once had entire control of the regiment, he would make a model body of men out of it. The Confederate Army of Tennessee, under General Braxton Bragg, had besieged William S. Rosecrans and his Union men by occupying key high terrain around Chattanooga, Tennessee. Major General Ulysses S. Grant was given command of Union forces in the West, and significant reinforcements began to arrive with him in Chattanooga from Mississippi and the Eastern Theater. Here for two months, the two armies faced each other, the enemy having its line of communication by rail from Atlanta open and unobstructed was well supplied with food, while our army, dependent on a difficult and torturous route from Bridgeport over the mountains, was for several weeks reduced to half rations of food and forage, while clothing and other supplies could not be gotten through at all. Judson Bishop. They opened up what was called the Cracker Line. A big part of that had to do with another Minnesotan that we haven't talked about. And he had been a captain and later a brigadier general from Hastings, Minnesota. His name was William LeDuc. And he was a quartermaster. His job was to supply the army. And he did a miraculous job of that at Chattanooga. Grant had a particular problem. He was funneling in more troops, but the Confederates had a ring of troops on the high ground along Missionary Ridge. On one end was Tunnel Hill. On the other end was Lookout Mountain. The Confederates had plenty of artillery, looking right down on the Union positions. So first, Grant ordered that Lookout Mountain be taken. Tuesday, November 24th. We're still in line in front. We could plainly see General Hooker's troops charging up the sides of Lookout Mountain. The heavy clouds, which all day had enveloped the mountain summit, had gradually settled into the valley. Thus the battle of the afternoon was literally a battle above the clouds. Early the next morning as the sun broke through some cloud cover, they saw the stars and stripes flying from the crest of Lookout Mountain, and the cheering was amazing. Next to go was Missionary Ridge, the center position. While Sherman tied down great numbers of Confederates, Grant ordered the advance of Thomas's Corps, which included the 2nd Minnesota. So they go to the base of Missionary Ridge and they're, they're to stop. They're not to go any further. They're just to pin down Confederates. Well, they're pinning them down, but at the same time, the Confederates are shooting down the hill at them. So this became what's known as a soldier's fight. Hard to control can be disastrous. The soldiers themselves started up the, the side of the hill, mainly to get out of the Confederate fire. And the attack up the hill gained momentum, and soon they had driven the Confederates completely off the ridge, capturing over two dozen cannon, a lot of flags, nearly capturing General Bragg himself, and strictly on the orders of nobody knows who. After the Battle of Missionary Ridge, the siege of Chattanooga was lifted, and it was a time for the Union Army out west, under Grant, to refit, re-equip, and re-enlist. Beginning about four months before the enlistments actually expired, they would not have the threat of losing men right away. Their three-year terms would be up in May and June of the following spring. So in December and January, they re-enlisted. It was called veteranizing. December 20th. The matter of re-enlisting I had considered very seriously and really thought that I, in justice to myself, should return home enter some good school, and obtain an education. Having left school for the war at a little over 15 years of age, my education had since been neglected. At this stage of life, I felt the want of an education more than ever. I knew that when the war was ended, the country would be flooded with men of the disbanded army, and that a great immigration would soon follow the declaration of peace, and all would want employment, of course. I would have to stand my chances with the rest. With an education, I would have an advantage over the common run of wage workers. Billy Bircher. And if they signed on for the duration of the war, they were granted 30 days furlough. None of these men had been home. They'd been in the Army two and a half years, and they hadn't been back to Minnesota. December 25th, Christmas. But how dark, how cold, and how dreary. How dismal everything was in the camp. The band boys had all enlisted except Wagner and I and we now made up our minds not to remain out. 
The others had used every endeavor to coax us in, so we at last consented and were mustered in for another three years. We patiently waited for our pay and orders to go home, as the time drew near for our departure for the north. It seemed cruel for the boys who had not re-enlisted to be compelled to remain behind, but in a short time they would return home for good. January 8th. As we broke camp that morning and marched to the steamboat landing, we hailed the order with joy, knowing that soon we would be in the land of plenty and our suffering would be ended for at least the length of our furlough. We arrived in St. Paul on January 24th and proceeded to the International Hotel, where we were furnished with an elegant dinner a compliment we, having traveled all day in the cold, heartily appreciated. After dinner, I proceeded home to surprise Mother, and, as it was dark in the house, she must needs call for a lamp, and hold it up close to my face, and look me over from head to foot, while she was saying to herself, God bless you, my boy. Although I know my name had not been forgotten in the evening prayer all the while I was away, yet not once, perhaps, in all this time had Mother's voice been so choked in utterance as now. With her heart overflowing, she gave thanks for my safe return. When I lay down that night in a clean white bed, for the first time in two and a half years, I thank God for my safe arrival. Billy Bircher The veteranized boys enjoy their 30 days at home in Minnesota, visiting family and friends, being feasted and relaxing. February 26th. I had spent my furlough visiting friends in the country and at home with Brother Joe, and was again anxious to do military duty. Remained at the fort until the 29th. During the 2nd, we made preparations for our departure to the south. Billy Bircher. So they get back to the south, and they've got some replacements with them, some reinforcements. And when they arrive, of course, the, the guys who did not veteranize are quite glad to see their comrades again. They almost look like a regiment once more. Some of them have new uniforms, but those quickly become tattered and, and faded. And so the veterans teach the rookies how to become soldiers. They are now a hardened unit, well-trusted. Thomas has them as the tip of his spear. After veteranization, the second Minnesota is now under the command of General William Tecumseh Sherman, and they're on their way to Atlanta. Sherman is known as a fighter, but the Confederates are under the command of Joe Johnston, and he's more known for his maneuvers. And so Sherman's frustration begins. He wants to fight, but Joe Johnston keeps strategically withdrawing in the face of Sherman's advances. They're moving closer to Atlanta, but it seems to be taking quite a bit of time. In fact, over a 100-day period, there was never a moment of silence. If the guns stopped firing, even for a few seconds, men would wake up because they were so used to the noise at this point. Then they ran into a place called Kennesaw Mountain. Joe Johnston has good high ground and he digs in. Sherman takes this opportunity to stage an attack. And it's not good for the Union Army at this point. They lose heavily that afternoon. So they're kind of stuck in the trenches in front of Kennesaw Mountain for a few more days. And it's at this point, the end of June, when those guys in the second who did not veteranize, now their three years are up, it's their third anniversary, they get to go home. One of them is Peter Wheeler, the first sergeant. He had opted not to veteranize. He thought he had a more important calling to go back and take care of his family. The evening of June 24th, Colonel Bishop went up to Peter Wheeler and said, you're due to be out in a couple of hours. There's a wagon here that'll take you back to Chattanooga, get on the train and go back home. It's been an honor and a privilege serving with you. Peter Wheeler says, no, sir. He says, I've got one more job to do. I have to move up Company C into the front trenches because that's our position for tonight. The night being clear and not a cloud in the sky and a full moon shining, it would have been very easy for the rebels on Kennesaw to see the glistening of our guns as we marched in the rear of our works. So Colonel Bishop gave orders to carry the gun barrels down and under the overcoats or blankets, and to make no noise. We thus made the march of nearly a mile right under the guns of Kennesaw in silence and safety. But the commander of the troops we were to relieve made so much noise in getting his men awake and into line as to attract the enemy's attention. He opened a big gun on us while standing exposed and waiting for the breastworks to be vacated. 
the flash of the gun was like the full moon. And an instant later, the big shell burst at the head of the regiment and killed our Sergeant Major, Billy Bircher. Sergeant Major Peter Wheeler was one who did not veteranize. Had he lived three hours longer, he would have gone with the others to the rear for his discharge. Let's get a little bit of the big picture here. It's almost September. The election for President Lincoln or for a new president is in November. The political pressure mounts. There's also pressure on the South. Jeff Davis, the president of the Confederacy, is tired of Joe Johnston constantly retreating without fighting. So he replaces Johnston with John Hood, a fighter who's been out east. He lost an arm at Gettysburg. He loses a leg at Chickamauga. He's a fighter, although he fights strapped to a horse and he's taking laudanum, a, a form of morphine, literally every day for the pain. And Hood comes out swinging. He takes command and within days he launches attacks on Sherman's army, which is exactly what Sherman wants. Fighting on the defensive now, Sherman annihilates Hood's army, drives him out of Atlanta, captures the Keystone, splitting the Confederacy in two again. After Vicksburg split it at the Mississippi, now it's close to fracturing into a hundred pieces, if you will. Now comes a big decision. He presents Atlanta as a victory for Lincoln, which pretty well guarantees Lincoln the presidency in, in November. And now Sherman has to convince Grant of what he wants to do next. He wants to finish the division of the Confederacy into two big parts. He wants to take his army unattached. He just wants to detach from his supply lines and march across Georgia who knows where. Sherman's not even sure. He's hoping to get to Savannah, but he's not sure exactly where he'll end up. President Lincoln himself said it's like watching a gopher go down into a hole and not knowing what hole he's coming out of again. October 9th. We remained in camp all day. Weather very cold. We tried to ruminate in our minds what the matter was. Last month we were fighting facing south. Now we had the rebel army between us and Nashville, and again faced back north. We could not conceive what was the matter with Sherman. Billy Bircher. As the second Minnesota marched and forged through Georgia, the United States was preparing for a presidential election between Abraham Lincoln and George McClellan. November 8th. This was election day for president, the proudest day of my life. I was 18 years and four months old and cast my first ballot, which was for Abraham Lincoln. Our company cast 35 ballots, all for Lincoln. The McClellan men were scarce in our regiment. Billy Bircher. With Abraham Lincoln re-elected and Atlanta successfully taken, it's time for Sherman to begin his march to the sea. But first, he destroyed what was left of the city. November 15th. Weather cloudy, but warm and pleasant. Marched nine miles to Atlanta, and at night we destroyed the city by fire a grand and awful spectacle it presented to the beholder. Sherman goes to Savannah on the way. All he takes with him is coffee and hardtack and ammunition because the hardtack and the coffee is for the soldiers and the ammunition's for the guns. It's all he needs. He lives off the land. The men never ate so well. They learned to love sweet potatoes. They learned to love southern hams and bacon and all of the good food. And as they got closer to Savannah, they really learned to hate rice because that's all they had near the coast for the last couple of weeks of this journey. They had rice all the time and they got tired of rice. They finally make it to Savannah, reconnect with Union Supply ships in the Atlantic Ocean, and the Confederacy has been split in two again. This marks the, the beginning of the end for the Southern Confederacy. What a glorious campfire we had that Christmas Eve of 1864. We could go out to the fire at any time of the night we pleased, and we were pretty sure to go out three or four times a night, for it was too cold to sleep in the tent more than an hour at a stretch. And we would always find half a dozen boys sitting about the fire logs, smoking their pipes, telling yarns, or singing snatches of old songs. I hoped that we might live to recall those weird night scenes of army life, Billy Bircher. So they're in Savannah, Georgia, and again they spend about three or four weeks there uh, resupplying, getting a few replacements, new uniforms, re-equipping the army. And then they head off to where everybody wants to go, from Sherman to the lowliest little drummer boy. They want a crack at South Carolina. Here's a state 
the first state to secede, that's taken and sucked three years of their lives out of them, caused them to, to endure all this hardship and this fighting and everything else for what? Well, now it's payback time. On February 5th, we marched with unfurled flags, men cheering and singing tramp, 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 etc., crossing the Savannah River into South Carolina. Our army did not lack enthusiasm, and the prospect of a march through South Carolina was one that was exceedingly relished. Poor South Carolina. She was sandwiched in between two states who looked upon her as the original source of their past madness and their present trouble. As Sherman's army, including the second Minnesota, made its way through South Carolina, there were incidents that were kind of strange. The second Minnesota, for example, comes across the Broad River. This is north of the capital of Columbia. And they burn a bridge, a trestle, a railroad trestle, and they burn some railroad cars. And they even make note that because it's a Sunday, they only destroyed five miles of track and then held church services. But that attitude comes to an end. They cross the Pedee River, they, they get into North Carolina, and it's like the Army regains its senses again. And while they're in North Carolina, they hear of Grant's victory over Lee at Petersburg and the evacuation of Richmond and eventually the surrender at Appomattox. And the Army goes nuts. There's dancing, literally. Guys are hugging each other. They're dancing instead of marching up the roads. And they, they're put into camp and kind of a time of celebration for a day or so. And then they hear of Lincoln's assassination by John Wilkes Booth and the mood switches. We heard the sad news of the assassination of President Lincoln. After all our victories and successful campaigns, and just at the eve of peace, we had lost our commander-in-chief, our much-loved old Abe, Billy Bircher. So they're in the middle of North Carolina, one last struggle by the Confederacy, by Joe Johnston again, at a place called Bentonville, fails. Johnston begins negotiations for a final peace treaty with Sherman to surrender his army. And now the war is finally over and the boys are waiting to go home. And now Billy Bircher, the drummer boy who documents all of their marches, is writing things like, we made 28 miles today and it was real easy. Their packs are in wagons. They're carrying almost no ammunition for their guns. They're traveling light and the miles are melting away as they're hot-footing it up to Washington, D.C. They go through some familiar sounding names in Virginia, the battlefields where the first Minnesota fought and other, and, and other troops, the Union, fought through uh, terrible places like Fredericksburg, et cetera. They go past, they go through, through Richmond and see the former capital of the Confederacy now kind of a burnt out shell. They get to Washington and there's a two-day march. The first day, the Army of the Potomac, the Eastern Armies, march through Washington. Their parade takes eight hours to pass the reviewing stand. And the second day, it's Sherman's turn. And the Western troops march through, including the second Minnesota. They take six hours to march through Washington. After the Grand March and Review in Washington, the boys figure, it's over, let's go home. But it doesn't happen quite that fast. The Grand Review is in the end of May, the 24th and 25th were the two dates, I believe. And now they're slowly, because they had veteranized and they owed the government some more time, they're shuffled around, camped here or there, they march, they eventually make their way back to familiar stomping grounds in Louisville, Kentucky, where the end of June, they're told that they can finally go home. General J.W. Bishop. I have the honor to enclose to you a copy of the order relieving your regiment from the Corps and directing you to report at Fort Snelling. Until the time of separation came, none knew how strong were the attachments formed in our months and years of associations and hardships and dangers as soldiers. His relations to the officers and men of the 2nd Minnesota have always been a matter of pride and satisfaction to the Corps commander, and from no regiment in the Corps will he part with a deeper regret. He thanks one and all of the members of the organization for the constancy and devotion which have always marked their attention to the duties and requirements of soldiers in camp and on the march as well as on the field of action. He congratulates you that your labors, hardships, and dangers are over, and that with a country restored to peace and prosperity partly through your exertions and sacrifices, you return once more to your homes. 
None have a better record for discipline and drill, and all the minutiae of soldierly conduct as well as uniform gallantry on every field of action in which they have been engaged in the Second Minnesota. And your state owes you thanks for the uniformly faithful manner in which you have performed your share of the task allotted to the soldiers of the Union. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, A.C. McClurg. We were then disbanded and said the last goodbye to our comrades in arms, the great majority of whom we would never, in all probability, see again. And the more hearty, rough and ready, affectionate goodbye there never was in all this wide world. Songs were sung, hands were shaken, or rather wrung. Many a loud, hearty, God bless you old fellow resounded, and many were the toasts and healths that were drunk before the men parted for good. It was midnight when the last campfire of the old 2nd Minnesota Regiment broke up. Goodbye, boys, goodbye. God bless you, old fellow, was shouted again and again, as by companies or in squads we were off for our different homes. Some of us bound north, some east, some west, but thank God, all bound for home sweet home. Billy Bircher, drummer boy, 2nd Minnesota, Company K.